Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm Erica Allen. We are starting a new worship series studying through the book of Genesis, and I'm glad everybody else is so excited. I got that way um, about an hour ago when they were excited too. Genesis is an interesting book to walk through, but I'm excited to walk through it with you. I, I want to share a time about, um, I was in eighth grade, and I was given a social studies assignment. Anybody here been in eighth grade social studies? I think our teacher, it was like, you know, that time after middle school where we'd taken the state test and they were just giving us stuff to keep us busy. Anybody remember those days in school? Okay. Um, and our social studies, my eighth grade social studies teacher, Mr. Manier, gave us a project called a family tree. Anybody done this project before at school? The family tree. Um, and I remember, like, beginning to explore our family tree. I am not one who uh, settles for a B or a C on things, so I was going to have the best family tree that went back to like the beginning of time. That was my, um, my focus on this because that's just who I am sometimes, um, or most of the time. Anyway, um, I got started on this family tree project and I began calling family members, asking them questions trying to figure out how to fill out all those leaves on the family tree. And I remember the, the moments, this, this project that was just supposed to take up busy time before the end of the school year so we wouldn't be misbehaving, this project that was just kind of given to us to keep us busy, I remember it turned into an adventure for me. Because I began to hear stories about how my grandfather and my grandmother met and fell in love. And it was wonderful and a beautiful story. I heard stories about how my grandfather's family helped to start the church that I grew up in and that introduced me to Jesus. I heard stories about my, grand, my great-grandmother um, going to a boarding school. and I, I, My grandmother even had a recording of this thing that she learned to recite. And I got to hear my great-grandmother's voice for the first time ever, years after she died, because they had taken time to record this story that she would tell her family that she learned in a boarding school. I learned my dad left when I was young, so I didn't have a lot of connection to him or his family, but I sat down with my grandfather, his dad, and I learned stories about this family um, coming to eastern North Carolina, setting up a farm, surviving through, through droughts. I, I learned about they didn't get running water. They were one of the last people um, in the area to get running water and electricity to their house. I learned phenomenal stories. I learned about the ways that they told stories, about the ways God saved them and delivered them from some of these fires and emptiness that we sang about earlier. And this is what I began to hear, that I was a part of something bigger than a project to keep me busy and, and, and focused during the last part of the year. I was a part of a family. I belonged to a story of power and resilience, of strength and adventure, of new things and new ways to reach people through Jesus, I began to hear who I was. I was a part of a story that was bigger than myself. About a month ago, I sat down with a friend who I've been in friendship with for a little over a year name. His, now. His name was Nadim, and I said, tell me your story. Nadine came here um, right after 2000, about 2002, 2003, uh, because he lived in a place where Al-Qaeda was, um, he was a Christian, he came to know Jesus because missionaries came and shared about God with them, and so him and his family were Christians, which was a minority in this place in, in Pakistan, and as he started a new business as an adult, he was literally being persecuted, like chased by Al-Qaeda, um, trying, like, his life was being threatened, so he got a special whatever and got to come to the United States of America with nothing. He'd started three successful businesses in Pakistan, and he came here with absolutely nothing. No friends. He didn't know the language well. He didn't own anything. He couldn't access his money because he was fleeing, literally fleeing from persecution. And he, he tells me this story about, about coming here and, and about 
um, you know, just literally being delivered from, from being chased um, for, for his life. And, and he tells this story about how a couple of weeks in, he just was like, I don't, I, maybe it would have been better to just stay there and die because I have no friends, I have no connection with my family, I have nothing here. And someone sees him and takes him to this church in Virginia, Florist United Methodist Church, and they begin to, to provide the needs for him. And he, he hears this call to ministry, and he begins to serve in northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., as a missionary to people here in the United States who don't yet believe in Jesus. And he looked at me as he tells me this story that's just really incredible and powerful, right, about the ways God redeemed him and saved him. And he looked at me, and, and I was like, Nadine, this is the coolest story I've ever heard. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. And he says, Erica, you are a Christian. This is your story too. This is your story too. You are a part, sitting in these chairs, you are a part of a brand new church that was dreamed over a decade ago by the United Methodist Church to reach new and younger people. Look around at the younger people in here to reach them with the good news and the love and the kindness of Jesus that they may be set on fire to share that good news and kindness and love generously with a world desperate for it. Look, look around you. You are part of an adventurous story too. You are part of a family. You belong here. You belong to part of who God is. God is doing something incredible. And you, you are a part of it. This is your story too. So this next eight weeks isn't about keeping us busy or filling some time in the summer with a sermon series that can last for eight months. This is a story that we are learning about the beginning of creation. We're going we're gonna to study about the creator of the world. We're going to learn our place in this world and God's dream for us in the whole world. This is not... This is not a, a, a time where we're just going to fill an hour on Sunday morning. This is a time where we will hear the beginning of our story. We will know deeper who we are, and we will be compelled to shine light and ignite change with a world that's desperate, desperate for this story to include them too. Amen? Amen. We are part of something incredible. So I want to start with why we study the Bible. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes to, Paul is this new pastor and um, of a new, of starting all these churches and he's in jail now because he started churches and he was persecuted and much like Nadim, he was put somewhere and to just be quiet and not do anything and behave in jail. And he couldn't do it. He starts writing, starts writing these letters to people who followed this way of Jesus. The Jesus who died on a cross and was rose again and creates this whole new way and movement for people to live that, that believes in new life and the new dream of God. And, and he's writing letters to these churches and to the leaders of those churches. And this is what he says. From infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures is the Bible. So from infancy, from the time you were a child, your parents made sure you knew about the stories contained in the Bible. Those of you who are bringing your children here to learn about the love of Jesus and about the scriptures from infancy, thank you. What you're doing is part of a bigger story and a bigger adventure that we could never imagine. Thank you for what you're doing. From infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in, Je in Christ Jesus. Here's the deal. We're going to learn today about the creation of the world. Next week, we're going to learn about sin. So everybody bring your friends. We're going to talk about sin <laughs> next week. Uh, it's going to be great. No, seriously, come next week. It's going to be great. We're going to learn about the brokenness and some of your, your hard questions about it. We're going to learn about it. But we're, what we're going to talk about today is that everything about this, about this Holy Bible, points us to Jesus whose one sole purpose was to save us from all the things, all the broken things in this world that try to pull us away from the goodness and love and kindness of Jesus. So all scripture is, oh, can you go back to 15? Sorry. From infancy, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So that's why we're here, to strengthen our faith. All Scripture, all of the Bible is God-breathed. God breathes it, inspired it, and is useful for teaching. 
So we are going to learn. You are going to be taught rebuking. You are going to face some things in your life that need to be changed. I, I do this with a lot of kindness and grace, so y'all don't have to worry about me yelling at you today unless I get excited about good stuff. Correcting and training in righteousness. So it's about growing. This is what, how we grow in our faith. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Did y'all hear this? We're not reading Genesis so you can use this thing as a weapon. We are using it so you will be equipped for good work in a world desperate for you to shine light and ignite change. Okay? This is about good work. So let's turn over to Genesis. Let's talk a little bit about it. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. If you brought your Bibles with you, this is the perfect time to bring your Bible, the next seven weeks, because you can just like literally turn to page one and you're there. And no one will know. You don't know where books in the Bible are. So bring your Bibles with you next week. Pull out your phone, whatever you want to do. Um, we're going to be in Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. It is believed that Moses, the leader of the Israelites, sort of began or wrote this um, to help us understand things about it. And um, we, um, th this is what we're going to talk about. It's where our story begins. It has a few poems in it, so we'll read some poetry. Anybody here fans of poetry? There's a few poems in here, so we'll, get, uh, we'll see some poetry. But it is mainly a narrative. It is a story that tells our history. It is a, it's a historical narrative, so it begins to tell sort of a story of how things began. There are several themes that we're going to look at in Genesis over the course of the summer, but today what we're going to focus on, each week we're going to sort of look at three things. The Bible um, shows us who God is. So we're going to use this book of the Bible and we're going to learn who is God. So some of you are like, I don't know if I believe in God. We're going to learn all about who God is in this. Who God is. The second thing that the Bible does is it shows us who we are. So this thing is like a mirror. We begin to hear who we are and how we're made and created. We'll hear about things that tend to become our natural tendencies, the, the way we were created. It's going to show us who we are in this. So you will know yourself deeper at the end of this uh, message series. And the third thing it does is it reveals God's dream for the entire world. So you're like, I don't know what God's doing here. I don't know why this happened. I don't. We are going to begin to learn what God's dream is for the whole world and what's your part in it. So y'all ready? Let's go. All right. Um, Genesis introduces us first to the creator of the universe. Genesis 1-1. This is how our Bibles start. These are the first words. The first sentence in the Bible is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first thing we learn is that God is our creator and God created everything in the world. What does that mean? Why is it important? Because if God created these things, it means God is more powerful than we are. And there are some people in this room who struggle, all of us struggle with wanting to be more powerful than God. Some of us, it takes the form of addiction. Some of us, it takes the form of, of you know, other things, like we all probably struggle with addiction. So mainly we try to cling to these things that will make us more powerful and stronger than the God who created us. This tells us God is more powerful than we are and is our creator. And there's some hope in that. There's some real comfort in that because you don't have to worry so much about being on top of everything because God has created us. God creates something out of nothing. The second verse says the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the water. So God is our creator. And what that means is God's more powerful than we are. And the second thing that that means is that this tells us who God is. When there was nothing and the earth was formless and void, there was nothing but chaos, God created something. He created order out of that. What does that mean for you? Who in here feels like your life has ever been formless and void? Chaotic and dark and stirring and nothing really good coming out of it? This tells us that that's when God does God's best work. That God is a creator creating something out of nothing. So if you're sitting here this morning and your life feels like it amounts to about nothing, I want you to know that's when our God, 
That's when our God wants to create something beautiful and amazing and powerful. So this tells us about who God is. The second thing it does is it tells us who we are. Let's be real about reading this part, this next part of God's holy word. Um, Some of you feel like a number in a corporation. Some of you are in relationships that are toxic and demeaning. Some of you have exes that take up all of your energy. Some of you are older, facing retirement or just your limited ability to do what you used to do and you've lost your dignity. Some of you are black or brown or whatever and you feel less than everybody else because this world has has convinced us to live like this. Some of us are struggling with our jobs. Some of us are struggling with our parenting, our marriages. So many of us feel like we are nothing. And thousands and thousands of years ago, we are going to learn that the creator of the universe had a dream to create humans in his image. Thousands and thousands of years ago, God had a dream that you were worth creating for a purpose that fulfilled his dream. So before we get to humankind, let's, um, because it, it's important that we hear a few things about how God made things before we get to human, humankind. So in Genesis chapter 1, the first few verses, um, the first days 1 through 3, so after God created the world, created something out of nothing, it tells us sort of this order in the way that God created things. So days 1 through, through 3, God creates, uh, can you go back? Sorry. God creates substance on a formless earth. So there was nothing, and God begins to put sort of flesh and bones on the earth. So God creates a formless earth. So on day one, light and dark. On day two, light and sky. And on three, I forgot what three is. Can you go to the next one? Sorry. Land, sea, and vegetation. When you get home, if you want to read Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 through 13, you can learn about this. So this is when there's, you know, day and night, the water, the sky, land, sea, vegetation. So he begins to put some form around the earth. Days 4, 5, and 6 is God begins to fill an empty earth. So this is when um, God creates the sun and the moon, living creatures, and then humankind is made in God's image. So have y'all ever heard the term, save the best for last? God is saving the best for last. So he makes humankind in God's image. So he creates flesh and bones sort of on this, and then he creates um, the things that fill the earth. I want you to know that we don't know what God, what this means by day. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. It took a while for God to create these things. So some of you who are sitting here with a void and formless life, I want you to know this good news. It took a while for God's work to be made known and full, fully revealed in this. So it might take a little bit for God to fix your job situation. It might take a little bit for God to fix your marriage situation. It might take a little bit for you to get into recovery and heal from addiction. These things don't happen overnight. But God is about creating new days and new lives and new things. That's, that's who we learn that God says that he is. So, sorry, I don't have my things, my notes in the right order. Um, so let's, let's read now chapter, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind in his own image, In the image of God, God created them. Many of you this morning may be asking, am I really someone important? And many of you might answer that hardly, barely. I don't feel very important. Let me tell you this. Thousands and thousands of years ago, the creator of the universe had a dream in his heart to create humans in his image. When God created the animals, he told them to be fruitful and multiply according to its kind. But when God created humans, we were given a a different purpose. We were formed in the image of God, not just to to increase the species, but to increase God's likeness in the world. 
God trusted us to bring about goodness and kindness and grace and love and make it real in the world. God trusts you to do that. So when somebody asks you, are you important? Yes, I am here to bear God's goodness and love, God's grace and kindness to a world desperate for it. God's dream. The third thing the Bible tells us about is God's dream. And God's dream, before we're going to talk about sin next week and how sin and brokenness entered the world. But before it entered the world, God's dream for the world was that humans would cling to, they would claim their image and their purpose as part of God. And that they would increase hope, kindness, patience, and grace in a world desperate for it. Sin and brokenness did enter the world after this. We're going to talk about that next week. But I want you to know God's dream for the world is that humans would claim their image and purpose as part of God's story and that we would increase God's kindness in the world. There is a woman who is a part of our church who shared with me that she has struggled for years with her identity and image. She struggled with addiction. She felt empty and like nothing satisfied. Nothing could satisfy her. And she shares this story with me about, about literally a life that was chaotic and formless, dark, dark and hard to deal with. She struggled for years for this, with this. Her sister began to introduce her to the faith that she had just started to claim as a young adult. She'd been introduced to Jesus and she claimed faith in Jesus. And, and she began to hear about this image of God that we are all created in. And then all the things in the world that cover that image up or try to hide it from the world. Parents who maybe are are abusive or verbally or physically. A world that that judges you by your ability to to perform in certain ways. Uh, you, you, You get access to drugs or TV shows or whatever that helps to, and it it begins to just sort of cover up that bright image of God that you were created with in there. And and, and she began to hear from from her sister about, about Jesus who came to the world, conquered sin and death and all of those things that try to steal the image of God from us and begins to, to get away those layers that have covered up our ability to be image bearers of God. And so slowly, Jesus just just takes away some of those things that have kept us from showing that image to the world, from bearing that image, from claiming it as our own. We find freedom, right? We sang about that. First thing this morning, we find freedom. We find hope. We find grace. We find goodness. We find that image of God being being born again in us, being seen again. So she tells this story about how Jesus literally saves her. Do you hear how everything in this story points us to the Jesus who wants to save us? Save us from all the things that cover up our image. But she doesn't stop there. Because it's not just about God's image in you being known. It's about you figuring out what it's like to deal with all of those things that cover up the image of God in us. And beginning to one by one just sort of deal with people, help people find Jesus so he can begin to scrape that away in the lives of other people. She didn't start a program. She didn't start a ministry with thousands of people in it. She didn't start a a mega church with five billion people in it. That's not what she did. One by one, she finds people who are lost and searching that that image of God may be made real and known in them and through them. And little by little, she disciples, walks alongside them, that they may find Jesus who restores that image in us again. Who restores that image in us again. This morning, I want to close. There are some of you who don't believe that you are created in the image of God. You don't know about Jesus who who wants to save you and redeem you, that you may know about that and share it with the world. There is somebody in here who hasn't yet made that decision. This morning, Chris will be up here. I'll be in the back. Come pray with us. We would love to help you take your next step for that. There are some of you who do know about the power of Jesus to show that image to a world desperate for it. How can you connect deeper to it and shine it a little brighter for the world to see? 
And there are some of you in here, there are some of you in here who God is asking to take a courageous next step. Not to start a program or a new church, not to start a new ministry with 5,000 people, but one by one find somebody whose image of God has been shattered and broken in their lives and to introduce them to the God who wants to reveal a new way of living through Jesus Christ. What are you going to do this morning? Will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for creating us in your image. We ask for your forgiveness for all the ways we haven't treated the people around us like they were created in your image. We pray this morning that that image that you created us in, that dream that you had in your heart thousands of years ago when you created humankind, when you created us as worthy and wonderful, God, that you'll begin to uncover that again this morning for us. We pray that you will reveal to us the next step that we can take in showing this world about the image that you want us to bear to the world. Show us the people who you want us to help to, through the power of Jesus for you to just uncover that image in them, that they may tell a new story, that they may sing a new song. We love you and we thank you so much for loving us. Amen.